am I? Or better yet, who do I think I am? These may be the most common questions in all of history, ranging back to the philosophers, Aristotle, Francois Voltaire, or even our very own Homer Simpson. But regardless of the challenge that this question brings us, it's well worth the pursuit. Find the answer to who one is is like finding the golden key to your life. With it, you can unlock personal alignment, fulfillment, and yes, the all too common TEDx theme, happiness. But today, I'm not gonna talk to you about who you uniquely are. That's for you to find out on your own personal journey. But what I am here to do is show you the subtle difference between who you are and who you think you are. I believe knowing this difference could be one of the biggest breakthroughs you can make in your life, as it did my own. Now, since this TEDx talk or TEDx theme is shift, what I want you guys to do is when I do this, you say the theme. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let's do it again. Yeah, okay, there we go. All right, so ready and... Oh, man, nailed it. Okay, cool. All right, now we can get started. So I started asking the question, who am I? All the way back seven years at Los Gatos High School, right over in that building in Mr. Sakamoto's classroom. And there I sat next to a friend named John, very talkative, bright guy, but he met me during a very dark time in my life. You see, I used to have a dog. And for those of you who don't have a dog here, what I'm about to tell you is gonna sound really weird. But whenever something was a little distressful in my life and no human, could understand, I would take my dog on a walk and talk to him, telling him all my deepest and darkest secrets. He was essentially my personal therapist. So one day, like all living things do, he died. And all those memories went with him. And so I was at school one day, and that's when I met John. He looked over and said, hey, what's going on? What's on your mind? And I told him. He actually listened the kind of friend that everyone should have, one that reaches out. So there I was, sitting next to John in the classroom, and instead of me being depressed, it was him that day. He was withdrawn, quiet, so I thought, being a high school student, I immediately assumed that he was on drugs. So being bold and insensitive, I turned and looked at him and I said, John, are you on drugs? And he turned and looked at me and said, you'll never believe it. My family thought the same thing, so they took me to see a doctor. And they ran all these tests on me, and they came back and they told me I wasn't on drugs. Of course not. But they found something else, that I have a disorder called unipolar disorder, essentially a genetic form of depression. My brain doesn't produce the right number of chemicals to feel things such as happiness. And it turns out most people who commit suicide in the United States have these symptoms. So I guess I know how I'm going to die. And to help, the doctors put me on drugs. So yeah, Jeff, I'm on drugs. Have you ever asked a question, and when you heard the answer, you wish you never asked it? Well, that's where I was in that classroom. Here I was, trying to crack a joke, and now my friend has a life sentence. Confused? Stunned? Depressed? It was really surreal. So I did the only thing I thought was appropriate, and I just said, hey, if you need to talk, let me know. He said, okay, but we didn't talk much after that. We sort of drifted apart. But little did he know, though, the worst was yet to come. And that's when I started asking the question, who am I? But not who am I, who did John think he was? Because whenever we hear something about someone, a diagnosis or a new label, we sort of have a shift in our minds. So when he was John, the good friend, it became John, the good friend with unipolar disorder. My mind, get ready for it, started to have a... Yeah. Oh, nailed it. And I started to see him differently. And his friends found out, family found out, even teachers, and everyone saw him differently, and eventually, John had his own shift in his self-image. 
Now, what is a self-image? Well, it can be broken into two different parts. The first part's pretty simple. Essentially, how you see yourself. All the labels you assign to yourself. When you have the question, who am I? Or I'm the kind of person that is, fill in the blank. That's your self-image. I'm a passionate person, aggressive, successful, whatever it may be. Now, you probably could have deduced that just by looking at the word. But the next part's super interesting to me. You see, the self-image is like a rubber band. If you try and outperform that label you have, you'll snap down. You try and underperform, you'll snap back up. So you essentially box yourself in in a level of performance just by your label. And that's why it's so important to understand a self-image because most people get confused between their self-image and what they're really capable of. Now that's the self-image. But what happens when everyone around you sees you differently? Well, in psychology, this is called the Pygmalion effect, or the polygamy effect, as I once thought. But it's, <laughs> seriously, I, I literally did that. I was like, P polygamy? So it was <laughs> Pygmalion effect. And what this is, is when you see someone differently, that actually has a role in how that person behaves. For instance, there was a study in the military where they had 105 troops for 15 weeks, and the commanding officer who was in charge got all the bios, got all the tests, and then some researchers came in and said, hey, here's the highest potential, medium potential, and lowest potential. With that information, during those 15 weeks, the command officer focused on those high potential shoulders. And through that time, at the end, they were tested. And of course, the highest potential soldiers scored 15% better. But here's the twist. The highest potential group the researchers lied. They just made up some random people and said, oh, they're the highest potential. Go ahead and mess with it. But the fascinating part is simply by the commanding officer seeing these people and treating them differently, those troops started to think, act, and believe as so, and then performed as high-performing troops. What this means for you is that when you see someone and treat them differently based off of some label you have in your mind, that actually plays a role in who they become. Now that we understand a little bit more about the self-image and the Pygmalion effect, that's the who you think you are part. But what about the who you are? What is that really? Well, I'll walk you through a simple thought experiment. Imagine that we're in a world that we can create anything. So we decide to make one basketball player who's gonna shoot basketball shots and name her Alice. And Alice has a 50% ability to make a shot, but she doesn't know that. So one day we give her the ball and say, go ahead and shoot. And she's on fire. She makes every single one, comes back, gives him the ball and sits down. Pause. Where do you think her self-image is? Probably really high because she's made every single shot in her life. But what if she missed all of them? Where would her self-image be? Probably really low. So here's the follow-up question. If Alice with a high self-image kept shooting over and over again, would she converge to 50% that we assigned her? Well, yes. But what if she had a low self-image? Would she converge? No. And that doesn't make mathematical sense. But here's why. As we learned earlier, the self-image, we get boxed in to who we think we are. And with that, we start to think, act, and believe in accordance, even though we have more potential. And that is the biggest fallacy that we make. We go out in life, make a mistake, 5, 10, 15 times of trying something, and conclude, I'm no good at this. I suck. And then you get boxed in, risking never following what you're truly capable of becoming. And that's why it's so critical to understand that who you think you are is a self-image and the Pygmalion effect, but who you are is this percentage that Alice may never know. She will never know that in her life, just how you will not know who you are capable of becoming in your life. So what does this have to do with John, the guy in the classroom? Well, I found out later that John went to a very prestigious college, but after many diagnoses, he didn't break through. So he went to see a very prestigious doctor in the Bay Area hoping she would tell him something different. So she goes to see him, 
and she tells him something that changed his life. What she told him was, John, I don't think you have a permanent diagnosis, but rather a temporary situation that if you change the environment, your symptoms will go away. Now here is the first time in John's life that someone told him, I don't think you have unipolar disorder. So he started to question this over and over, and he started to have, get ready for it, a? Yeah. Awesome job. <laughs> in his mind of how he saw himself, he started to ask, am I the person with unipolar disorder, or is that who I think I am? And he worked with this doctor week after week, month after month. Three months go by, six months go by, a whole year goes by, and he's sitting in the classroom, and the first time he felt, felt an emotion that he hasn't felt in years, that regardless of all the past diagnoses and all the close calls of mortality, he felt happiness. Symbolic that there is hope for a normal life. And little did he know that seven years later, he would be in the same town, same school, same building when he first felt these symptoms, staying on this stage, sharing his message with you. John is not real. I am John. The conversation in the classroom, that was my friend asking me if I was on drugs. The story about the dog, yeah, he died, but that was the first time in my life I learned who I really was and how I could break through. But it wasn't the diagnosis that was the problem, for it was completely accurate. It summarized my past experiences, genetics, and formed a conclusion to help. But what also happened was I began to associate myself with the label, limiting my chance of breaking through. And I got lucky. I had someone see something in me that I did not see in myself. And that's what led to the breakthrough. And that's exactly the reason why I'm here today. Because you may know someone who has a label that's holding them back, or maybe that's you. And hopefully from the information in this talk, you can create that breakthrough you were looking for. To wrap up, I hope you had a, get ready for it, yeah. and you're thinking that who you think you are is your past experiences, but who you are lies dormant and for you to discover. That the labels that you see people actually change the way they become for the better or for the worse. And lastly, that you had a... Yeah. That you are not who you think you are. Thank you.